Oh my goodness me, you can take your seats. It's so good to be here. On Friday night when I turned up, I thought, I've got a great message. And, and then 200 young people turned up at the meeting and I thought, this is going to go badly. And I was quite nervous preaching in front of... 205 young people. and But I was nervous in the first meeting this morning because Alan Davies was there. And uh, he's like the David Attenborough of preaching and I'm here describing a camel. And uh, so I was, I was so, help me out in this service. I'm still shocked from having to preach in front of the Prince of Preachers in the first service. And so please don't go quiet on me because I'm still in uh, PSD, I think they call it. And, uh, and, uh, but it's great to be here. What a church. How many legends are in this church? Just so many legends. And uh, it's great to be here. I think I preached here 12 years ago, something like that. And we've been in, in England, in Great Britain, for three decades and finally escaped. And now we are running a church on the Gold Coast, the Gold Coast. Can you think of a more opposite city than, uh, than Sheffield, England, than the Gold Coast? And uh, so we're, we're loving it. But it rains so much, though. Our house leaks. And uh, my wife, was. we bought this place in Broadbeach and she was quite happy about it until four days later, it's leaking away into the bedroom and still leaks into the bedroom. It's really hard to find the source of a good leak, isn't it? And it's taken us ages, but finally a builder's promised to fix it up. But there's been no romance in the bedroom, none whatsoever, because it just smells musty. It's, a, it's just a horrible place to be sleeping in. And uh, so it's kind of ruined the first bit of um, us moving back, but uh, we're full of faith. Full of expectation. <laughs> now, I'm going to talk about how to have a slightly better marriage. That's my title. And uh, I think the problem we've got with, with people who do stuff on marriage is, is they put the bar up here and it actually makes your marriage worse because nobody can actually achieve that bar, not even the person preaching about that bar. They make it up. And so I want to just bring the bar down just a little bit beyond where you're actually at. That's it, ta-da. And I just kind of think that, that the, the characteristic of Christianity isn't a standard of holiness. It's not character. It's transformation. It's change. And I think as long as you're changing, then we're in business. And as long as, as, long as there's, there's an evolution of your character and an evolution of, of, of you as a person, then, uh, then we're doing great because that's what the Christian message is about, the power to change. And uh, so if I can just, just rub out how to have a perfect marriage. The problem with perfection is it just doesn't exist. And there's, there's, there's a lot of sharp knives of perfectionism running through the church of God in the 21st century. And, and so it just creates, it creates, it divides us up between the public us and the private us. And I just don't think that's as healthy as it, as it needs to be. And I think authenticity is to come back to what does God expect from you? And what's God looking for? And I think slightly better is, is a great goal because you can achieve it and it creates momentum. And then you can be, a, and also you can be thankful for slightly better. You know, I mean, you know, you want to have a fairly good marriage, but there's no point having a brilliant marriage. It's okay. I mean, it adds something to it, but fairly good's good, isn't it? Okay. Um, so, but I'm going to start with those six things you'll never hear a man say. Number one, I thought the bed sheets might need changing, so I've popped them in the washing machine, and I'll come back when they've all dried. Okay, I thought that might be. Number two, I thought that red dress with the big sleeves looks good on you, but there's no rush. There's plenty of other shops we can try before you make up your mind. Number three, no, it's, it's nothing as bad as the flu. I've just got a case of the sniffles. Number four, I'm completely lost. So I wind down the window and ask that man for directions. <laughs> Number five, things you'll never hear a man say. I've written all the Christmas cards. And now I'll make a list of all the presents that we need to buy. And number six, lastly, I'll be just as happy with a kiss and a cuddle this evening. I find that very amusing. I know you can't laugh because it's church. <laughs> and I know it, <laughs> we need to have a respectable exterior in church, but I know you're laughing on the inside. <laughs> uh, let me uh, firstly say about me and my wife that we're, we're very different. 
like really different. And I'll tell you what's one of the things that's really different about is, is my love language is different to her love language. My love language is words of affirmation and she's not very good at it. And I've tried to correct her on many occasions. And uh, when she sends me a text, it's just kind of like an instruction. It's, it's got no, it's got no, st- I always say, listen, just top and tail it, you know. Just make it at high Dave, how's it going? And then put some kisses on the end, you know. When she does kisses, she goes XXC because C's really near the X, right? But it's just a sloppy way of saying I love you. It's kind of I kind of love you, you know, just a little bit. But I couldn't be bothered correcting the C and making another X out of it. And I've tried to make her use emojis. Like, I'm, I don't know how, do you like emojis, Faith Church? I just like them. I like the monkeys, I just like the three monkeys. I just, I just like them. And, and it just kind of makes a text cute. But, you know, she'll do it for half a day. And then she'll revert back to, to a text with spelling mistakes. Nothing at the end, just an instruction. And it just crushes me, Faith Church. It just crushes me. I've, I've just got to pick myself up every day just from the way she treats me. But, you know... But, you know, I've discovered with her that her love language is acts of service. And when you're married to someone whose love language is acts of service, nothing's ever good enough. Like, I try and do a lot for her. And it's like her her love language is like a bottomless pit. You know, I could rebuild the house and, and, uh, and make it Hampton style. Come on, women. Hampton style. And, and she'd go, oh, yeah, thanks, Dave. What are you going to do next for me? It's just nothing's quite good enough. And, uh, and I realized that we, we are incredibly different people, but God God's somehow put us together. And I think God's got a conundrum going on, right? Because if he puts similar people together, similar people are more enjoyable than marriage. But different complementary people, the more effective the marriage. So God's got Houston, we got a problem here because he wants us to enjoy our lives. He wants us to have a really enjoyable life, right? But he wants us to have an effective life. He wants us to be purpose-filled, not just, not just pleasure-filled, but purpose-filled. And so, so he's, he's created a spectrum, a marriage spectrum. Here is total enjoyment. You know the people who post stuff on Instagram as if, gosh, wow, it looks like life's incredible for you two. But over here on this end of the spectrum is effectiveness. And I've got a feeling that God puts a little more emphasis upon effectiveness because He puts often more people that are different together than more people that are the same together. And if you can realize that two are better than one, I'm going to read that scripture. If you realize two are better than one because they have a greater reward for their labor, then you'll be more satisfied with the complementary nature of your marriage. Here's the scripture, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 10. It says, two are better than one because they got a good return uh, for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity the one who falls and has no one else to help them up. Um, Also, if two lie down together, they'll keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. So, so that seems like, like on the spectrum, you've got contentment. I want contentment. But over this side of the spectrum, you've got conquest. And God loves conquest because you're here on this planet to fulfill purpose. And there's happiness in purpose. And yet somehow everything's lending us to complain about our partner because they're different to us. And yet the difference is designed so that we can be more effective for God. Now, let me say this about love languages, that each each personality has a different love language. If you're, if you're melancholic, then your love language is always going to be words of affirmation. If you're sanguine, your love language is going to be a touch, physical touch, a physical touch. If you're phlegmatic and you're a peaceful person, your love language is going to be quality time. And if you're a choleric person, lying spirited person, then your love language is going to be acts of service. 
And so every one of us have different love languages. But can I say, before I get into this, the, the, the problem if you marry someone that's identical to you, number one is they're identical to you and you know you more than anyone knows you. It'll be a terrible relationship. But two sanguines married together are going to giggle a lot. But they're not going to get a lot done. They're going to have a lot of fun, post lots of Instagram pictures, but they're not going to do a lot. Two phlegmatics aren't going to know what time of day it is. You know, the battery's always running out on their phone. They, they, they're quite, quite disorganised. And so, again, they'll enjoy each other's company, but they won't get much done. Two melancholics are going to cry a lot together. And two cholerics are going to bang heads together. And so even if you got what you want, it wouldn't be as enjoyable as you think it would if you got what you want. That's my introduction. How's my introduction? Give me a hand clap just to encourage me. So here's some, here's some um, keys, more keys on how to, have a, how to have a slightly better marriage. Number one, go back to your first love. Here's the scripture for it. Revelations 2 verse 4. Don't forsake the love that you had at first. Go back. The person that you married is still there. I mean, they're under the gristle, under the disappointments of life, but they're still there. And our job to create a slightly better marriage is to go back to the person you first fell in love with. When I first met my wife, it was a it was just an incredible occasion. We we're in the centre of Brisbane in King George Square. And I'd met thousands of women prior to her. And, and, and yet when I met her, I don't know about you, but inside my head is a circus. And inside that circus, this circus employs monkeys. And all the monkeys, when they go into the circus, have picked up a pair of symbols. So inside my head, Day and night are monkeys bashing symbols together. Now, when I met my wife, the symbols stopped clanging. It's amazing. Out of everyone I've met, she's the only one where the symbols stopped clanging. And I've met thousands of women since that point. But nobody creates the same effect in my mind as she does. She brings and gives to me Peace of mind. And when I realise that, it makes her unique amongst tens of thousands. But I need to meditate on it by going back to my first love. And let me say this about peace of mind. I'd call it the sixth love language. Number five is presence, and everybody loves presence. But number six is peace of mind. When you go into a restaurant and you see an old couple sitting together, right? Uh, old, I mean over 40, and they're sitting together. They're not talking to each other. You think that's the last kind of marriage I want is how bored are they with each other? You know, they just haven't said a word to each other in 20 minutes, you know. And then, but the problem with that is the other couples that are talking too much. They either just met each other trying to show off their stories, right? Or they're having an affair. But I realise that the sixth love language is peace of mind and peace of heart. And it's the, it, it, I would say the sixth love language is the language of silence. And some of you are silent when it comes to your partner, but there's a great understanding you have with them and they've got a great understanding with you because you know each other. It's a deep knowing. Never discount the power of deeply knowing the other person. It, it, you might think, well, it's because love's dead. I want to suggest to you, it's because love's alive. And if you can value the power of silence, then you realise this isn't boring, this is deep. This is actually a silent form of communication. And some of you need to go back, go back, picture, imagine the person that you first loved. Because they're still there. And our job as husbands and our job as wives is to find the treasure, the hidden treasure, to push back the Coke cans of, of disappointment, to take out the barbed wire of crises, to take out the topsoil of mundane and to find the hidden treasures which God placed in front of you in the first place. I think it's the end of my first point. I thought it was a pretty good point. I, I was passionate about it. I gave it my best shot.
Number two is don't let them become the single source of your emotional fulfillment. If you try it, you're in big trouble because no one's got the capacity to give the partner the amount of love that they actually need. You need a lot of love, you know. You, you need a lot of emotional investment. And, and that's why two people that are infatuated with each other, it never lasts because you can't keep coming up with the brilliance that they're demanding from you. It just runs dry. Now, I've got some statistics that I've made up and I'm going to run them by you as if they're true, right? That out of, out of all of your emotion fulfillment, 25% of it ought to come directly from God. Now watch this, it's 25%. When you meet someone who's getting 100% from God, it seems odd. They seem to have very little friends, right? And it's okay for a mini season, but some people live on the mountaintop and they become super spiritual. There's issues that are never resolved within the heart. So I would say to you, 25% needs to come directly from God. 25% from family, and friends and community, like today. That's why you can't really get totally fulfilled on the internet. You need to be here in presence with people because there's an emotional transfer that goes on. Even in a banter, there's an emotional transfer. You know, they used to say a church that prays together stays together. I say a church that banters together stays together. And 25% of your emotional fulfillment should come from your partner. And then 25% from achieving great things for God. Now, I'll say that adds up to 100%, right? But no one's ever at 100%. And even if you've got the best marriage in the world with the best relationship with God in the world, with the best friends in the world, you'll still be 10% lonely. Loneliness needs to become your friend because the only reason why we're lonely is because we don't actually belong to planet Earth. We've come from a heavenly country that God sent us here in order to not to live in, in, in residence, but to live in tents because we are visiting this planet on our way to a heavenly kingdom. And so you'll never fit. Even on the best days, we think, wow, life's great. You'll still be driving home with a little tad sense of loneliness within you because this world in all of its glory cannot totally emotionally fulfill you because you were born for a distant country. Now, let me say this about God, that God knows the language of the Word of God because He wrote it, but He also knows the language of human. And the language of human has many dialects. And when it comes to you, when God speaks to you, He speaks to you through your love language. Now, we think that you've got in the world word people and spirit people. There's been a fight between the two. You know, some say, people say, some people say we need more spirit. Others say we need more word. And, and there's been a division line between Joel people uh, where he'll pour out his spirit on all, and Isaiah people where his word won't return void. May I suggest it's completely personality driven? Because on this side, we've got the cholerics and the melancholics, but on this side, we've got the phlegmatics and we've got the sanguines. And because God wants to relate to you and wants to fill your emotional tank, he knows who you are because he created that, then he speaks your love language. And if you're choleric, if you're line-spirited, if, you, if your catchphrase is, let's do it now, then what God's going to do is do a lot of acts of service to you. His, his love language is miracles. And God wants to do a whole range of miracles. You know, I'm surprised with my wife how many bargains she gets when she goes shopping. And it's not just because she's a clever shopper. It's because God goes with her when she's shopping. Because it means a lot to her. When she gets something at more than 50% off, she shows me. She says, oh, guess how much this was? Guess how much this was? I'm thinking it's probably $2, right? But I'm going to start at $200, right? And it's just, I don't know. i got to go with it. That, that, then she got $2. I go, yeah, that's incredible. You know? But it's, it's God's love language for her. She, she, when she was 18, she, she went into Brisbane City and, and she had no money. But she felt God say, go into the parking bay area that you've got to pay for. And the car two in front, the guy pulled the ticket out, the bar went up. The car in front, the woman pulled the ticket out, the bar went up. When she came up to, to the bar, no ticket came out, the bar just went up. She got free parking. But she's a little bit lazy because she could have just parked up the street. But there's a lot of miracles that are unnecessary miracles. She doesn't need a new dress. 
Shouldn't need new handbags. She's got enough handbags to, to, for all a whole village summer overseas for everyone to have a handbag. She doesn't need it. But you see, God does unnecessary miracles. Why would he do that? Love language. And I would say for a lot of people in this room, expect great things from God. Expect miracles. Because that's how God speaks to you. Some of you lowered your expectation, thinking life's a drudgery. No, no, expect miracles. Because that's how God speaks to you. For me, my love language is, uh, is um, words of affirmation. And, uh, and so we, if you find me in my devotional life uh, in, in the Word of God, I'm always in the second half of Isaiah. First half's a bit violent. But the second half is just beautiful. And it's just, it's just beautiful writing. And I love beautiful writing. It, you know, if, if someone sends me a word of encouragement, I always screenshot it. And always post it into my notes. I've got, I've got like, like 6,000 entries in my notes because I'm screenshotting words of encouragement. Because that's how God speaks to me. He speaks to me through words. I'm in the Psalms day and night because that's how God speaks to me. See, if you're a spirit person, if you're a Joel person, you'll be a sanguine or you'll be a phlegmatic. Sanguines, your love language is physical touch. And so your language with heaven is a touch of the Holy Spirit. You ought to be crying out day and night, God, touch me with the Holy Spirit. Because some of us in this room do not need a touch of the Holy Spirit because we're word people. It's not our love language. But there's others in this room, over 25% of you in this room, that you need a regular touch of the Holy Spirit. And let me say this, God's ready to touch you far more often than He is to a melancholic and a cleric. Am I preaching well or is this just brilliant? I suggest this brilliant, right? And if you're a phlegmatic person, then, then your love language is quality time and God wants to, He wants to fill the atmosphere. You're a presence lover. You love the presence of God. So don't rush around so much. Just lie on the floor and put on Laura Tingle. I don't even know her name, but put her on, right? And, and just worship God on the floor. Give God some quality time with you. And when you get up off the floor, you'll be rejuvenated. Because God wants to fulfill you more and more. The more God fulfills you, the less demand you put upon others people to fulfill you. Some of you have besties that have turned on you and it's ripped your life apart. Some of you have had partners that have disappeared on you. It's ripped your life apart. May I suggest this isn't protection for the future, but this is the right addition for your future. Dig a well with God. And don't think that God's just so full of theology. God's filled with language. In the beginning was the Word. And God is fluent in the Word and in human. And He wants to relate to you and He wants to lift you and He wants to to fill you up. He wants to touch you. Let me me, just draw this in. Number three, don't compare your partner to anybody else's. Because when you do, they're not funny enough. They're not smart enough. They're not travel enough. They're not sensitive enough. They're not sexy enough. They're not extrovert enough. Some people in my life are like the sun. When they walk into the room, the room lights up. I love them. I just love them. I love sunshine. But some women in my life are like the wind. It's just refreshing. I feel refreshed. Just had a cup of coffee, but I feel refreshed. It's because they're wind. They just blow in a fresh breeze. Some women in my life are like the beach. They're just kind of fun. You know, I'm here to try and rescue people from the gates of hell to populate heaven. It's a tough gig, this. So I kind of need some fun people around about me. Now, I've discovered my wife's not the sun. She's, she's not the wind. And she's not the beach. What I have discovered is she's the ocean. Nothing compares to the ocean. The sun's brilliant. The wind is windy. The beach is okay. But the ocean. I'm married to someone who's a mystery. And that mystery keeps me captivated. She's got a horizon. She she disappears over the horizon. I think, where are you going? 
But she comes back and on a little ship, a sapphire is from heaven. I, I wrote a poem, right? And I'm going to read it. Would it be, how, can I read it to you, this poem? That, can I, is, is it okay? Second service, you're sounding like the first service. <laughs> it's called Nobody. I wrote this for her. You like the turquoise ocean. Beautiful, alive, glistening. Within you is the deeper than deep, the near and far. You live where the distant ocean touches another world, where a world of angels, where God speaks and your heart laps its shores. Your voice brings heaven to earth. In the unseen world, the waves of heaven pound and crash upon the earth. While you speak, the hungry hear, the humble rise. Your beauty arose, always poised for more. Like Mary at the wedding, you cry, do it now, Lord. You're always ready, waiting and listening. Like the angels of Jacob, you live ascending and descending a ladder that unites the two worlds. You're astonishing. Here's my best bit. You're like heaven's top model. I like that. Oh, I really like that. I thought, Dave, you're so clever. Just clever. That's clever. Put that in. Don't, don't change that. Right? <laughs> don't edit that out. I said, yet you live with me and are loved by me. Who else gets you in their lifetime? Nobody. Uh huh. Uh huh. Sorry, man. I've just made you have to write a poem now. As long as I don't get sunburned, as long as I don't put a big sail up to catch more wind than I ought to, as long as I don't put a whole lot of volleyball courts up on the beach to spend too long on the beach, I'm married to the ocean. Don't compare your partner with anybody else's partner because they're incomparable. Here's my last point. Make sure you L-Y-M. Make sure you love them more than they love you. If they say love you, go L-Y-M, love you more. If they go love you more, go love you much more. Just always be the last one because you want to lopside this thing. Because the problem with love is, is we think, well, we're the present Bible. You haven't bought me a present in four years. You bought one from the service station. <laughs> but we won't call that spanner a present. <laughs> You've got a love language and you operate out of your love language. The problem is that we all think that we love the world and love our partners more than they love us. And it's because they speak in Italian to you and you're speaking Spanish to them. But it's not true. And most people roll up their gift after a while and they do this in middle age as well. They think, well, I'm just sick of this. I'm going to roll my gift up because it's unappreciated. Sure, it's unappreciated because no one quite gets it because it's your gift. No one can do what you do. No one does what you do as well as you do. But it's your gift. It's, it's a gift from heaven. It's a gift praised by heaven. It's not a gift thoroughly. You are misunderstood by earth and will be consistently misunderstood by earth because nobody quite gets you because you've got a divine spark in you that's different. It's different. You're like Aldi. You're good. <laughs> but, but different. You got a middle central aisle in you with all kinds of stuff, and then no one quite knows what they're going to get. I, I've decided. I tell you, it's it's to my credit and to my victory. I've decided to love the world more than it loves me. I've rubbed out the small print. And I think the key to a healthy marriage is to rub out the small print. Just get your scissors out and cut out the strings attached because that ain't love. The moment you say, well, I did this for you two and a half years ago, bang, there's the string that changes it from a love transaction to a business transaction. The moment you bring it up, you change the nature of it. But you didn't go into marriage for a business, did you? Well, stop bringing stuff up. If you did it, you did it under God. And you did it from the rivers of God. You did it for God's reward. You did it because you're responsible with the gift 
and the talent that God gave you. And so you used it. But don't expect that to come back to you. This is between you and heaven. And the moment you take pressure off your partner and pressure off the world, a lot of Christians hate the world. Once you... Once you take the conditions off and, and, and take the high expectation off, it's amazing how much better people are when they're with you. People love me more now, I expect less from them. Because they can feel it. And acceptance. They can feel the celebration. I'm trying to find the gold within them. They can, they can feel I'm trying to love the, what, what is buried underneath the topsoil. So they can get that. And... and I just think that, that some of you just got this list of stuff. Well, he ain't done that. He ain't done that. He ain't done that. She's not like this. She's not like that. And I wish that that and the world just. So you die bitter instead of better. But it's your fault. It's because you got all these little small print. Get your scissors out. Little toenail scissors, fingernail scissors, paper scissors. It doesn't matter. Just get a razor blade out. Nip off the strings attached. We're LYMing the world. Now, say this about LYMing, right? God LYMs me a lot more than I LY him. Let's get this right. He loves me a million times more than I love him. I love him in a crummy way, it's inconsistent. It's like a perennial river or imperennial river, whatever it is. I didn't do geography very well. It's going to on off, on off, on off, on off, on off, on off, on off. He's consistent. He LYMs me all of the time. And so as he does for me, I do for the world. It's the secret of having a contented life because they're not expecting everyone to do it back to you because you've come out of the business world you come into the world of love. Here endeth my message. Finito. It's the end. It's been great talking to you today. Allow me to pray for you. Father, place a pair of scissors in the hands of everyone here. Because we think that the friend who turned against us owes us something. We think the world that's been so unjust to us owes us something. Uh, We think that that our, our husbands and our wives and our partners owe us something. Father God is driving us crazy because they just can't come up with it. And whenever we go the extra mile, they just retract. And our presence are far better than their presence. Father, help us today, God, to stop that. And help us today, Lord, to release them into their God-given love language. We might not be ours. We might not understand it. But Lord God, we're not their governor or governess. And Father, right now in this room, I pray that all small print will be rubbed out by our eraser of heaven. We thank you, Jesus, that you've done that for us. You've forgiven us of our recent sins. And you've forgiven us of our midterm sins. And you've forgiven us of our long term waywardness. You are incredible, God. You are a God of faith, consistently believing in us and wanting to find treasure and open it up for our enjoyment and for the salvation of mankind. And even today, right now, whatever you've done, wherever you've come from, Jesus Christ is here to love you more. This is not an equal transaction between heaven and earth. Religion is, but true Christianity isn't. It's God first loved us. And then we loved Him in our own way in return. But if you want to receive the love of heaven, and you want to receive the forgiveness of sins, and you want to receive a fresh start, and you want to receive emotional support from heaven, then I'm going to pray an introductory prayer. And if this is you, I want you to pray with me. Maybe you're a backslider. Maybe you've never come uh, to church before. Maybe you've come from another religion or you've come from being an atheist, but you realize that God is real. The next step is to invite Him into your heart. How about everybody help us out? Dear Lord, say this after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I invite you afresh into the center of my heart. 
I want you to be everything for me. I want you to be my emotional fulfillment. I want you to be my lover, my saviour, and my God. Forgive me of every sin through your death upon the cross. Cancel every misgiving and every misadventure. In Jesus' name. See, you know, you owe him nothing. He's just cut everything you thought you need to do for God. He's, you owe him nothing. Because he loves you first. And then we let it flow. If you prayed that prayer and you're a backslider returning or you've never prayed that prayer before, it was introductory. But what's more important than that prayer is to draw a line in the sand between your history and your future. And to draw a line in the sand, I'm going to get you to do one thing when I count to three, and that is to lift up your right hand and leave it up till all the hands are up. But this is, this is personal. This is your line in the sand. And sometimes you just need to do that. Otherwise, life's too much on a continuum. It's, you need to break it up into seasons. And this is the launch of a new season. It's with your God. You're not working for God. You're not being driven by God. You are with God because He is for you. So if you prayed that prayer, and you're a backslider returning or you've never prayed that prayer before, on the count of three, I want you to lift up your hand and leave it up till all the hands are up. Three, two, one. Lift it, lift it, lift it, lift it. Lift it, all eyes closed, lift it, lift it. Hands up on my left-hand side. There's one hand up. There's two hands up. Let's keep going here. Let's keep going here. In the middle section at the top, there's three hands up. Come on, keep it up so I can see it, so I can see it. Father God, Father God, Lord, I'm guessing there's four or five hands up in this place. And we thank you, Jesus, for fresh introductions. And we thank you for new beginnings. We thank you for fresh starts. You put your hand down. And we thank you that their lives have been invaded by the love of heaven from this moment on. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Hey, God bless you, Faith. It's been great to talk to you. And I'll see you again sometime soon. this morning. If you did put your hand up and you want to know more about that decision you made, you can go out to our Next Step counter in the foyer and have a chat with the team out there and they'll help you with your decision. You know, this morning, um, you know, every time we have a guest ministry, we like to bless them uh, through just an honorarium. And just because Dave has been with us all weekend and every message he's shared has just been amazing for each one of us and spoken into our lives. So our way is to thank him for coming to our church. And that is we do a ministry offering. And, you know, there are many ways you can give. But up here on the screen, we have um, just... We, this is our bank account that if you want to give, you can give. Just take a, a snapshot of that with your phone or you can go to our info counter out there and uh, just let them know that's what you want to do and they can do an FPOS uh, a deposit for you there as well. So thank you so much for your giving this morning. Wasn't that just fantastic being in church today? Yes. So we have, for all of our mums and all the women as you leave the auditorium today, we've got some chocolates for you just to enjoy sometime today or over the next week as well. Also, we have our photo booth, which we love doing, and that's out in the foyer as well, just in the glassed area there. You can go there, take your family, have a photo, and um, we do it every year, and everyone loves it. So do that again today, and you can go to the Facebook page, and that's where you'll find your photos as well. Let's stand. Happy Mother's Day to all the mums. We hope that you enjoy today and have a great lunch or brunch or whatever you're going to do today. Enjoy and we'll see you all next weekend.